What's going on? My name is Michael and welcome to Fudge Muppet. You're probably not surprised to hear that I've been continuing to rack up some serious hours in Starfield and I'm still finding new things that I didn't know about. There's just so much to see and do in this game and now that we're finally out of the early access period, all of you have access to Starfield, meaning that together we can all share our personal experiences and new info we come across in the comments. Today we're covering 9 more things you need to know before playing Starfield. About half of these things are from players who played in the pre-order period and left comments under our previous videos that simply deserve some good exposure so everyone has the best Starfield experience possible. The first thing on this list is something I discovered through the use of console command testing and that is that there's essentially no level cap in this game. I'd seen a lot of people say that there doesn't seem to be a level cap, but no one knew for sure if eventually there was one. Well I wasn't going to level up to 12,255 myself, was I? 12,255 is the level I was able to reach through adding XP via console commands. Of course, I wouldn't recommend using console commands because it's just not a fun way to play, it makes your save called modded, it disables achievements, and look, who wants to cheat anyway? You'll also still need to rank up your skills manually too, but for the purpose of finding out if there is a level cap, I kept pumping in that XP until finally my level stopped growing. I don't think anyone is going to reach level 12,255, so you can safely play as if a level cap doesn't exist. Even the little icon near my level kept changing between different styles up through the thousands so I'm not sure how set that is or if it's more like a randomized thing and then it starts repeating itself as it gets that high. Anyway what this actually means functionally for your Starfield experience is that you can always get more skill points to max out the things you want. Subjectively speaking I find it can be nice in games where level caps do exist at some point to force you to create only one type of build but at the end of the day it's completely up to you how you want to play. If you want to master every skill in the game, then go for it. If you'd prefer to start a new playthrough with a new background and new traits and choose new skills then, feeling like a completely different character as you go through the game again, you can do that too. With New Game Plus and people wanting to test multiple skills on one playthrough, then it seems totally possible to just go and unlock everything and keep playing the game. I suppose the fact that you have to rank up skills mean you still earn everything you eventually reach. It's not like you get a XP for running around killing aliens with a gun, which by the way is a great way to get XP, and then throw that XP into increasing melee weapon damage as you could in Fallout games for example, so take this information how you will. Personally I'd rather just make new builds and do separate playthroughs, but the option is absolutely there if you want to master everything on one save. The next thing on the list is how convenient the ship menu can actually be. I've made a whole piracy guide explaining boarding ships, smuggling contraband, how to deal with bounty, joining the Crimson Fleet, and so on. I also talked about stealing ships and selling them at one point. Now as you may know, you have to register ships before you can sell them, but for convenience, you can actually register a ship from your ship menu by simply pressing the register button, and it turns out to be cheaper than registering it at a ship vendor. Personally, I'd prefer it to be the other way around, where the convenient choice is actually more expensive, so it incentivizes advises you to actually go to the ship vendor, but it is what it is. So you board a ship or find one and you steal it. You can officially make it your home ship and transfer over your cargo and crew. However, if you want to sell the ship or modify it, then yes, you'll still need to go to a vendor. So if you do want to steal ships often and want the best profit possible, do the registration in the ship menu. The other thing the ship menu actually allows is related to your cargo. So you can actually view your cargo whenever you want from the ship menu and it seems like you can even jettison stuff from it too, sending back the message to dump whatever it is you want to get rid of from the cargo when you're far away from your ship. However, you can actually put stuff in your ship's cargo without being in your ship, so long as you're within 250 meters of it. This can be useful if you've just looted some creatures, enemies, or resources not too far from where you've landed. If you've got a huge haul too, and you're over encumbered but you're running it all back to your ship, it also helps to start putting it into your cargo early, and then because you're no longer over encumbered, you're able to get back to the ship faster, or just fast travel there if you want to, which is a lot quicker than if you force yourself to trudge back the final 250 meters yourself with no O2 left to the point of taking damage due to CO2 overload. 
Speaking of cargo, plenty of people have talked about how the room you get in the Constellation Lodge actually has a safe within it with unlimited storage. You could put all your resources here if you wanted to, or maybe just keep some items that you really want, like armor or unique aesthetic rewards, like different apparel you get from certain faction quests. Stuff that you want to keep, but you don't want taking up space in your ship's cargo. If you didn't know that, now you do, but an even better spot if you're into crafting is actually downstairs in the lodge's basement. This is where all the crafting stations can be found. The weapons bench, spacesuit bench, research lab, chemistry lab, cooking station, all that good stuff. So over here, there's one of those small yellow storage containers sitting on this desk. Opening it, you will see that it has unlimited storage space, which I think is a more convenient place for resources to store if you're going to be doing crafting and modding down here. It appears the other containers in this room have unlimited space too, but I don't know if I'd trust an ammo box to safely hold all my stuff. Just doesn't feel safe for some reason. Now, unlike your ship's cargo or the containers you build yourself at settlements, these containers in the lodge won't link into your crafting and settlement building automatically, but you can just take the items out of the box and then start crafting away and then put them back in when you're done. We discovered the fourth thing on this list through extensive in-game testing, and if you've watched a recent video of ours on the channel, then you may already know about this, and you would have heard that unarmed sucks. Do not play an unarmed build in Starfield unless you really, really just have to for whatever reason, but here's a summary of why it sucks, so anyone watching this video is saved from a grindy playthrough full of seething and pain. All the gameplay footage you see here is a high level, heavily invested unarmed character, taking ages to kill enemies at far lower levels. The boxing skill requires you to kill 170 enemies with unarmed to get to rank 3, which definitely feels like a grind due to the low damage output of the skill, and then you have to dump tons of skill points into the physical tree just to get further up into other skills like martial arts in tier 3 and neuro strikes in tier 4. These also take forever to level up, so the sooner you get here, the better. So boxing increases base unarmed damage and reduces O2 cost. Rank 4 gives a chance to knock down opponents. Martial arts then adds increased chance for crit chance, a chance to disarm but only on a power attack, makes you take less damage while unarmed, and reflect 50% damage when blocking an incoming melee attack, which is pretty rare. You might use this on a melee build if you want to, though it's not necessary as dueling itself is pretty good for melee, but adding martial arts to it is still way better than using unarmed and getting martial arts for that. Then with Neuro Strikes, Unarmed has a 20% chance to stun an NPC per punch with rank 3, rank 2 grants additional EM damage, and the final rank which was so insanely hard to grind to we didn't even get, but basically you can knock down nearby enemies when you stun one enemy. Regardless of whether you stun one enemy or multiple, the base damage is still just so weak that it's boring to just punch an enemy over and over again to chip away at a health bar when with any other method, be it melee or guns, they'd be dead 20 seconds ago. The footage you've been watching even has the isolation skill with no companions being used to increase damage output as much as possible. Check out our recent video if you want a more detailed breakdown, but you need to know to avoid an unarmed playthrough if doing so was what you planned, again, unless you just have to. Using companions is a fun part of the BGS experience, but sometimes they're just not all that effective at helping you in combat. So if you want to give your companion a particular weapon and have them use it, you can actually do so by opening up the menu to give them items and then give them a weapon and press equip. You'll also want to put the ammo type that the weapon uses in their inventory, and from testing it seems like they won't run out of ammo, but I have heard that if they ever do stop shooting, just check there is ammo there, and if there's not, put it in. Providing them with an explosive heavy weapon like a bridger, or even just a super high DPS weapon like a micro gun can be pretty cool. I liked giving them a magstorm. Just play around with it, because sometimes companions can just seem to not fight well with certain weapon types. It might be different for you, but I gave my companion a powerful magshot pistol, and they didn't go so well with it compared to other options. In general, I like the higher fire rate type of stuff over single shot, but higher damage type options for companions. You can even give them 
other melee weapons if you want to, like a Wakazashi or a Varun Painblade. In addition to giving them weapons, you can also give them a spacesuit. Now, I'm not sure if it's a glitch, but it seems like they won't always wear it, at least not visually. That said, if the little icon in the corner of the item name shows it is equipped on them as you have selected, then they still seem to benefit from it. For example, I gave Andresia a spacesuit that can cause fire damage on enemies, and even though it didn't look like she was wearing it, it was equipped when looking at her inventory and in combat, the enemies did in fact catch on fire, so I knew she must be wearing it from a stats perspective. Another neat little tip is that you can actually pick up items to manipulate them, whether that's to see them better or just to decorate, and you can rotate things when you hold down the trigger. Each trigger rotates a different way for ultimate control, and you can even click the sprint button to change the axis of rotation. To pick up the item, you just hold the same button you would use to open a door, so if you're playing Xbox, that would be A. Then to rotate things, you would use the left and right triggers, and click in the left stick when you want to change the axis. You can even throw the items you pick up by pressing the reload button. Now if you just tap the button, they'll be thrown with very weak power, but if you give it a good hold and then release, they'll go a lot further. There's not any sort of super powerful utility to get out of this, you can't throw a fire hydrant at someone and have it cause damage, but you can throw those explosive canisters you find around the place, and I've often lobbed them into a group of enemies and then shot it when they were in range of the explosion. You can have some real Michael Bay movie moments with that if you want to, it's just a whole lot of fun to do at times, but just be careful that you kind of hold it in cover and then pop out to throw it, because if you charge at your enemies holding an explosive canister in front of you, well, you can probably guess that won't go too well. In general, I do find picking up items makes things feel a lot more like a Bethesda game that we all know, and I'm so glad the rotate feature exists, so you can place items wherever you want to without them flipping down like they would in previous BGS games like Skyrim. The next thing you need to know will help a lot if you're trying to level up the theft skill by pickpocketing various citizens around the game. Pickpocketing is possible via the theft skill, which improves your chance of success with each rank and ultimately lets you steal holstered weapons. Well, even with one rank of theft, the chance you'll be able to steal someone's credits or other items from their pockets is not particularly high. It might be 63%, for example, maybe 70% for some things. This generally leaves you with two options to train the skill. One, you can just do it and cop getting caught and having bounties every now and then, or two, you can save your game and just load back every time you are caught. Neither of the options are particularly epic. However, a way that won't get you in trouble with the law or have you constantly loading saves feeling like a hack is actually getting an EM weapon, like those sold from the specialist shop in the Ryujin headquarters lobby on Neon, and then taking that gun to a location on a planet that would have enemies. Don't forget to buy the ammo and I do prefer to go to a place with weaker enemies for the level you are. You might go to a base with spaces or pirates, and what you can actually do is hit them with the EM weaponry until they're knocked out, and then you can actually pickpocket them. The chances of getting caught still remains, however, even if you get caught and the enemy gets back up, you can just hit them again with your EM weapon until they're knocked out, and have another attempt on the same person. It won't say they've already caught you once they're knocked out again and that you can't attempt it anymore. Overall, this method just helps level up pickpocket a lot faster if you don't want to save and load back so you can feel like a thief quicker without getting caught so often in cities and getting a bounty. Theft isn't a skill every build needs by any means, but it can be cool for stealth characters as there are occasionally times it helps in a quest to get someone's keycard to access a room or even a terminal that allows for a quest related option or just to force them to part with something that they refuse to without them knowing. You also need to know that you can get a lot of cool dialogue options popping up with a small investment into social tree skills. All those skills like intimidation, manipulation, diplomacy, negotiation, and so on will enter into conversation options at times. And in addition to being a regular speech option, you'll also notice that they can pop up throughout the general persuade minigame conversations, often allowing you to get more points towards winning a speech check with less risk. For example, your regular options might be plus one in green, plus three in orange and plus five in red, but with an intimidation option, you might have a plus three in green, meaning you can select it for the same low risk as the easiest plus one options, but with a plus three reward usually reserved for taking on more risk of failing the check. We have no concrete stats to prove whether additional ranks of these skills increase the chance that they work in dialogue, but from what we've noticed, it's that getting one rank seems to do the trick. You unlock a bunch of new options from then on, they tend to be effective, 
and they're great for role-playing. Sure, you might want to get things like Intimidation and continue to pump ranks into it to make enemies flee as part of your combat approach, however, you don't have to use that if all you care about is more options in dialogue. So for any speech character, I'd highly recommend getting these things, so long as they fit the role-playing of your character if you want the most fun options possible in dialogue. In general, there are a lot of dialogue options that can pop up for skills outside of the social tree, but some skills do appear more than others, and so far in my playthroughs I can report that as a general rule, it seems such skills are social tree related. And finally, we come to a great way to train up your piloting skill. Someone in the comments suggested this about a week ago, and I just really wanted to get this into a video to spread the word. Basically, there's a flight simulator test you do when you join the UC, which by the way has an awesome storyline, so I strongly recommend joining and experiencing that for yourself if it doesn't go against your role playing. Anyways, you can go here by going to the UC headquarters in New Atlantis in the Mars district and talk to Tuwala to join. Sarah Morgan actually takes you here super early on in the main story so you can't miss it. You'll eventually be directed to the piloting test and then you'll be able to continue doing it over and over again to defeat enemy ships in the simulation and to rank up your piloting skill which requires you to destroy ships. You can come back here whenever you want by going down the elevator to train your piloting even more. It feels like a bit of a hack sometimes but I guess it's actually pretty lore friendly if you think about it. You are literally training your piloting skill in a simulator that feels just like the real thing. You can of course just take on contracts to kill space pirates or simply let the skill passively rank up as you play the game for hours, but if you really want to get your piloting skill up fast, dump your skill points into it and get access to B-class and C-class ships faster, then this is absolutely a great way to do it. And that wraps up these 9 things you need to know before playing Starfield. Thank you so much for watching, subscribe for more Starfield content, especially our builds which we've got coming out. My name is Michael and I'll be back to nerd out with you again very soon.